Step 4. Wavelength Conversion. So we have seen how we can represent flying qubits and stationary memory qubits. So it would appear that we've got all the basic ingredients in order to actually build a quantum network. But things aren't as easy as they seem. Every piece of quantum hardware operates at different wavelengths optimally. For example, memories, they emit light of a particular wavelength only. Also, they require specific laser frequencies in order to be manipulated, to be, uh, be encoded, or to transfer um, photons into the fibers. The fibers themselves attenuate different wavelengths with different rates. Detectors also have their peak efficiency within a small wavelength interval. This really complicates things because we would like all of the components to work reliably and efficiently. So, let's see if we can change the wavelength of the photons that we are using for communication between the different components of the network. And in order to see how it works, we're going to have to look at something known as polarization of a dielectric material. Now, this polarization is different from what we saw in the previous steps, where we talked about polarization of electromagnetic waves or polarization of photons. Here, polarization refers to the charge distribution in the dielectric material. And it is given by this formula over here. The polarization P is a function of the electric field strength and these chi1, chi2, chi3 functions. They are called susceptibility of order 1, of order 2, of order 3. And it tells us how strong a particular process is. For example, chi1 characterizes the strength of the linear process. So how strongly the polarization responds to the first order of the electric field strength. The higher orders, the nonlinear orders, for example, like chi2, represent how strongly the polarization changes with respect to the square of the electric field strength. Higher orders can be ignored if the electric field is weak. But since we are using lasers, and the lasers are capable of producing very intense, strong uh, electric fields, we have to take them into account as well. And in fact, it's these nonlinear processes that will allow us to achieve wavelength conversion. So let's compute the polarization and look at the second order. Imagine that we have two coherent field input fields. One has uh, uh, amplitude E1 and frequency omega 1, while the other one has amplitude E2 and it's oscillating at frequency omega 2. If we square the resultant field, then we obtain the contribution to the second order of the polarization. And here we see that we have four frequency components. We've got two components which are just a double of the input frequencies. And then we've got these other components oscillating at the difference of the frequencies, omega 1 minus omega 2, as well as the sum of the frequencies, omega 1 plus omega 2. And it's these last two that we are in mostly interested in. We will use this fact that these components are present in the output field in order to achieve wavelength conversion. So the general picture of wavelength conversion is the following. We have some piece of dielectric material, and usually we call it a chi-2 crystal. We have two input fields at frequencies omega-1, omega-2, and we have an output field at the new frequency omega-3. Now let's look at the types of wavelength conversion that are mostly used. We can have some frequency generation, or SFG. This is when the input fields omega-1 and omega-2, their frequencies just add up and to produce omega-3. We can also have difference frequency generation, or DFG, and this is when omega-1 and omega-2 produce a new field at frequency omega-3, which is equal to the difference between omega-1 and omega-2. A particular type of some frequency generation, when omega-1 and omega-2 are the same, is known as second harmonic generation, or SHG. It looks like we are done with wavelength conversion, but this is not quite the case yet. And that's because these nonlinear processes are very inefficient. And this is due to the dispersion of the propagating beams. 
As the beams are propagating through the dielectric material, through the Kaito crystal, the beams drift apart and they lose stable phase relationship. And when this happens, destructive interference kicks in and whatever field we are producing is effectively cancelled out. So somehow we have to ensure that the two propagating beams maintain a stable relationship. This is known as phase matching. One way of achieving phase matching is the following. We can use alternating signs, positive and negative signs, of the Kaito crystal in order to produce this following structure. This technique is known as period, periodic polling. As the beams enter the positive uh, Kaito uh, part of the uh, p uh, structure, they drift apart and they are losing phase relationship. But at that point, they enter the negative part and they again drift closer together, maintaining or getting uh, closer to the proper phase matched relationship. This is not quite 100% effective. It's known as quasi phase matching only, but it does substantially increase the efficiency of the nonlinear process, resulting in a substantial signal at the end of, um, uh, of, this, of this procedure. So how does, this, how does this work in real life? How can we use it in quantum networking? Imagine that we have an entangled pair of qubits, where one of these qubits could be a memory qubit, a stationary qubit, and this other one is a flying qubit, so it's a photon. But we would like to interface it with a piece of hardware that doesn't really operate at this frequency omega one. So what we can do is we can mix this photon at frequency omega one with some other beam at frequency omega two. We can pass it through PPLN, a periodically polled lithium niobate material. That will result in a signal at a different wavelength with different frequency, omega-3, represented by this orange line and this orange photon. The crucial part here is that we are not only changing the frequency of the photon, we're doing it while maintaining the entanglement between the new photon and the quantum memory. And now this new photon at frequency omega-3 can be more easily interfaced with whatever piece of hardware we need. And this is the essence of wavelength conversion.